Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for the 24-25 NEA Big Read informational session. My name is Lauren Miller, and I am the NEA Big Read Program Manager at the National Endowment for the Arts, and I'm joining you all from Washington, D.C. I use she, her pronouns, and I am Caucasian, have long brown hair, and wearing a gray and black turtleneck. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to mention. First, everyone is muted during today's session. Closed captioning is available in the Zoom toolbar. We will have a Q&A at the end of this presentation. Please feel free to submit questions at any time. Any questions we do not answer live will receive follow-up. Today's webinar will last about up to an hour and it's also being recorded and we will share it later online. Okay, I'm going to now hand it over to NEA's Literary Arts Director, Amy Stoles. Thanks, Lauren, and hi, everyone. A hearty welcome to you all. My name is Amy Stoles. I direct the Literary Arts Program at the National Endowment for the Arts, which through various programs supports poets and prose writers and translators, nonprofit organizations like presses and journals, book festivals, reading series and literary centers, and large initiatives like Poetry Out Loud and the Big Read, which we're going to talk about today. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a light-skinned woman in my 50s with glasses, a flower pattern blouse and black sweater, and I have brown wavy hair falling just below my shoulders, that is, without my consent transitioning briskly to gray. You'll be guided through today's webinar by three long-term superb stewards of the Big Read. They are enormously kind and approachable and knowledgeable about a great many things. And I encourage you to reach out to them for answers and advice, especially to John and Josh, if you're uh, planning to um, submit an application to this program for the first time. But before I turn it over to them, I wanted to take a few moments to talk about why we at the NEA have a program like this, why we think what you all do is so important, and why we introduced some of the changes for this upcoming grant cycle that Lauren, Josh, and John are going to tell you more about. At its core, this program has always been about the power and joy of reading, whether it's a powerful poem, or a humorous story, or a haunting memoir, or an engrossing novel. We know that reading leads to good outcomes, like greater empathy, and enhancing the act of reading through conversation and creative responses can deepen the experience and bring us together in ways we so desperately need now more than ever. And our own research office, for example, released new data last month showing a sharp decrease in reading over the last decade. And if you're interested, you can find more information about that on our website. And I think Lauren's going to put that in the link, put that link in the chat, um, a link to the press release. So you have that. We obviously have our work cut out for us. But equally important among the goals of the Big Read program is to support community engagement through the arts and to encourage each member of a community to enjoy what NEA Chair Jackson calls an artful life. And in other words, this artful program has always been rooted in community and what we decided to do this time around in part to reinvigorate the program and because we get excited by new ideas and interesting tangents is to lean into that concept of community even more by asking you what defines your community. What was it like long ago? What is it like now? What's changing? What, what it might be in the future and, and how different might those answers be depending on who you ask. So we wanna hear your stories. So we offer you this theme, which they'll tell you about where we live as a new framework for programming. And we offer you an expanded list of 50 titles and authors who explore the theme beautifully in different ways to inspire you on your communities. And we are offering support for programming that allows you to work with local writers and folklorists and teaching artists to conduct interviews and host writing workshops that inspire folks to be creative and share their perspectives and the perspectives of friends and loved ones through their own writing and creative responses to the chosen book. And we'll see what happens. This has always been 
a grand experiment. So we're eager to see how this goes and we're super excited to follow your lead and see where you take us. And now I'm going to turn off my camera, not say anything else and turn it over to Lauren. Take it away, Lauren. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, now we're gonna go over today's agenda. So first we will talk about the basics of the program and the eligibility requirements. Then we'll talk about the changes that Amy just mentioned to the guidelines this year, including the introduction to, of the theme and the list of books. Then we'll go over programming requirements, ideas, and resources. And then we'll go through the details of the application process itself and how to register in Smart Simple and submit your intent to apply. And then finally, we'll have our Q&A session. And again, feel free to submit your questions um, during any point of this presentation. And now I am going to turn it over to Josh Weiss from Arts Midwest. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so before we dig into things, allow me to uh, introduce myself. So as Lauren mentioned, my name is Joshua Feist, and I am the Grants Officer at Arts Midwest. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a Caucasian male with short hair. Now, this program has been administered by um, us here at Arts Midwest for over 15 years. We are one of six regional arts organizations from around the country. And we support the arts in the Midwest region in the north, but we also work in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts on this NEA Big Read program. So just to be clear, the NEA Big Read is a national program, so applicants from all 50 states and territories are eligible. All right, so we'll get a little bit more into the program and talk about eligibility next. So for those of you who are new to this opportunity, the NEA Big Read is a federally funded project grant to support community reading programs designed around a single NEA Big Read book. The goals of this program are on this slide, and we hope that your programs will build more tightly knit communities through the power of literature and storytelling. Now, NEA Big Read programs can vary, and they can be as short as a week, or long as several months. So beyond discussions of the book, organizations present a kickoff event. They may invite the author of the book for a visit to the community or have other events inspired by the content themes of the book, which include panel discussions, lectures, film screenings, art exhibitions, uh, theatrical or musical performances, uh, poetry slams, writing workshops, you name it. One person, when they registered, asked how we define community in the context of this program. And our answer is that we really leave it up to you. What we most often see is an application uh, reflecting one town which, or a city or a county, but we are open to creative interpretations, which could mean neighboring towns getting together and submitting one application, um, a community of of online uh, participants or sister, sister cities, for example, just as long as the applicant can meet the eligibility requirements and review criteria and adequately explains in their proposal the community that they intend to serve. Uh, as I mentioned, an example might be two towns that can't meet the required match individually could pair up and pool their resources and maximize an author visit to the region if that's what they decide to do. Now I want to cover which organizations are eligible for this program for a minute here. And uh, we have all the eligible orgs on the left and the ineligible organizations on the right. So eligibility is pretty broad. So this program is better defined by those uh, that are not eligible, uh, which are individuals, for-profit businesses, K through 12 schools, whether they're public or private, um, artists or artist agents, and any organizations that need fiscal sponsorship, I'm afraid, are ineligible for this program. Uh, one point of clarification, a school district may apply, uh, but individual K-12 schools cannot. We got that question from one registrant, so I just wanted to highlight that. 
Also, institutions of higher education can apply in several ways, uh, either as the Board of Regents, maybe there's a university foundation, uh, or the university itself. Um, regardless, all applicants will need to provide uh, an employer identification number, or EIN, that identifies with the organization. And they'll also need a UEI, or Unique Entity Identifier number, from SAM.gov, which is tied to that applicant organization. We have a resource that we'll, uh, what we'll share towards the end of this presentation about acquiring a free UEI number uh, from SAM.gov. Also, local education agencies can also apply. They are eligible. So let's talk about uh, grant funds now. Uh, the amount that you can apply for ranges between $5,000 to $20,000. Uh, whatever amount you pick between the range, your organization and partners must match that, or in other words, put up the same amount from non-federal sources. So if you request a $10,000 grant, for example, you must bring $10,000 to the table. Um, so therefore, if you're Grant request is ten thousand. Your total project expenses should be at least twenty thousand. So that's the ten thousand from the grant request, and then the ten thousand of the match. Now, this match can come from several non-federal sources, such as earned revenue, uh, salaries, and wages for personnel involved in the project. It can be donations, other non-federal grants. Uh, or the value of in-kind contributions, or just straight up cash. Those are all eligible matching items. Be aware that we do have some unallowable expenses for this grant, and my colleague John will share a link to the page that we have on the Arts Midwest website that details uh, what most of those are. So if those appear in your application budget, we'll just send it back to you for a few revisions. All right, now I'll talk a little bit about changes this year to the program. As Amy mentioned, at the start, we have 50 book titles for applicants to choose from. And my colleague John will also share the link to that list of 50 titles in the chat. You can also type in this short URL that we have here on the slide into your web browser if you prefer, and you can grab the list in that way. All applicants will need to articulate how they will present their chosen book in context of the theme of where we live. And this question is included in the intent to apply form, which we'll cover in a few moments. Uh, so for example, someone might choose The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, which is a book about the Vietnam War, because they want to celebrate the veterans who live in their community. Another example might be selecting the Grapes of Wrath, and the applicant would include plans to program on the topic of their local environment in some way. You can get details on each one of these books at arts.gov slash NEA Big Read, as well as uh, the resources uh, listed on this slide here. Those are available at that website. Now I'll talk about uh, some of the programming requirements. This is, this is the minimum level of programming that every applicant will need to demonstrate in their full application. Um, we need to have a public kickoff event to launch the program in the community. Usually this takes the form of a book distribution or giveaway event. It could be a proclamation by a um, local official, something along those lines. There need to be three book discussions of your chosen NEA Big Read title. And these can happen anywhere at the library or private residences, um, but there need to be at least three. There should be one presentation inspired by the book. And an example of this could be a Q&A with the author, if you decide to bring them in. Uh, perhaps a panel discussion uh, with uh, local experts on one of the subjects in the book could be a lecture or a film screening as well. Uh, the next requirement is an artistic project or activity that engages the community or responds creatively to the theme of where we live. 
So an example of this might be a visual arts exhibition, um, a theatrical performance, or a poetry slam, just to name a few. Um, the next one is a three creative writing workshops. And uh, the topics for these could include uh, writing about your family's history, um, poetic responses to nature, Q and A's with your neighbors, or evoking worlds in a sci-fi context that grapple with real world challenges. Um, the last one is one activity that allows community voices to be shared publicly. And we've seen these in past programs uh, with examples like a public reading or an anthology of selected pieces from creative writing workshops. Um, they can be interviews with local community members uh, by a local writer, featured in a local newspaper or radio station, for example, or they could be a website of archived community stories. And these events may overlap, so you might have a presentation inspired by the book, and you could have a writing workshop tied into that, for example, so these can overlap. One registrant did ask about how the performing arts figures into an NEA Big Read program. And our answer to that is that the performing arts help drive the engagement of audiences with the theme and context of the book. And we'll showcase a few of those programming examples in a few minutes. Again, the goals of the Big Read are to inspire meaningful conversations, celebrate local creativity, elevate a wide variety of voices and perspectives, and to help build stronger connections in each community. So I'm going to hand it over to Lauren for the next segment. Thanks so much, Josh. Now I'm going to go over some resources that you may want to look into to assist with your programming. Please note, we're not endorsing any of these services specifically, but we're simply mentioning them as examples and there are a lot more out there. Please feel free to explore other available services. Uh, with that being said, first, we encourage communities to reach out to their local state arts agencies and humanities councils. They will have knowledge reg regarding local writers and teaching artists you may want to work with in your area who can lead writing workshops. We'll put a link with a list of all the state arts agencies and their contact information in the chat so you can find that. Also, if you're not a public library or a college or university yourself, um, we of course encourage you to reach out to them as well for potential resources. Local MFA students, recent graduates and faculty would make great partners in teaching writing workshops in your community. And then finally, um, we encourage you to look into literary organizations that have free resources to inspire or help with planning your programming. For example, Voice of Witness, and we'll include this link as well, um, has a lot of free resources and experience with interviewing community members. They also have free guides, including a do-it-yourself guide to start a storytelling project, how to host a workshop, and much more. Um, so feel free to look at that website if you'd like. Also, the Poets and Writers Directory is a way to find local writers in your community. You can search by geography and expertise um, to find local writers. And finally, you can look into organizations like The Moth and StoryCorps as examples of ways of sharing stories and communities. For instance, the moth works directly with writers on shaping their stories and their storytelling techniques. And um, both of these organizations provide great examples of storytelling that you may want to look into. Um, with that being said, I will pass it back over to Arts Midwest. Thanks, Lauren. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the theme of where we live now. Uh, so unlike previous grant cycles, when applicants program with an NEA Big Read approved book and the themes that that book contains, uh, for this year, or the 2024 through 2025 cycle of the Big Read, all applicants must articulate how they will present their chosen NEA Big Read approved book 
in the context of the theme of where we live. We've offered uh, five suggestions of ways of how we interpret this theme uh, in your programming plans. They're identified on the slide uh, right now. You can choose which one of these best resonates with your community and ties to your book choice, but you are not restricted to just uh, one of these five sub-themes, uh, but you'll need to clearly state how you're interpreting the theme of where we live in context with your community and book choice. So you can pick just environment, you can pick environment and people, you can mix and match how you would like to approach the theme of where we live. All right, so next I'm going to hand the mic over to my colleague, John Kaiser, who is a grant specialist here at Artsland West, and he will describe the theme and share some past programming examples that applicants could consider when proposing programs. Thanks, Josh. Hey, everybody, John Kaiser here, grant specialist. I use he, him. I am a Caucasian man with a uh, thinning hair at best, a uh, beard and a red, white, and blue flannel. So. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about theme this year, where we live, and we're going to go through now some um, potential programming ideas for you. Um, some of these are what folks have done in the past. Some of them are ideas that might work um, as you sort of come into this idea of where we live in some of these sub themes. So the way that we've broken this down is that we've broken it down by sub themes. So we're going to talk a little bit about the environment first. So this can be anything from exploring the night sky. Um, so this first example we have are planetary paintings, and this would certainly um, satisfy that artistic project program required. The other two that we have are actually exploring the uh, physical space in your area. So you can have wildlife experts, park rangers, um, folks who know a lot about the wildlife or the geology, um, or just the natural world of your community in general. So you can do anything from a uh, nature hike or, um, you know, some some uh, examples of the wildlife in your area. So on to the next one. We'll be talking about uh, the people of your area. So um, our first example will, comes to us from Kansas City Public Library. So for their kickoff event, they partnered with um, the Kansas City Indian Center to explore some of the indigenous cultures of that area. Um, speaker events are also a great way to engage with your community. These can be um, the author of your book, author of companion titles, um, experts in fields that you want to explore, ex historians. Um, the example we have there is there was a uh, rodeo uh, player event person. I don't know. Is that the right phrase? I don't know. I'm not a rodeo guy. Um, or you can do uh, a podcast and have local luminaries or residents of your area um, tell their story and have that sort of be um, a living record. Next up, we have industry and culture. This is a great area. So we have a couple of uh, art making activities that would really work well sort of in this particular category. So anything from quilt making to zine making um, to uh, other tactile artistry or crafts um, that come from your local community or um, have a connection to the community in some way. Next up, history. Um, so this can be anything from a gallery of historic photos. One example we have is a gallery of photos and paintings responding to the Vietnam War. Um, story slams, so you could gather community members together um, to share their stories from the community, it, whether it uh, be recent or distant history. Um, another great example is the Native Nation poetry map. Um, so this actually explores the history of the community through written and spoken words. So you can have uh, poems that already exist, or you can do a call for poems from your community members as well. Um, finally, uh, one of the another sort of fun element is the alternate reality uh, sub theme. Um, so this could be anywhere from creating a mural of an imagined landscape, um, maybe thinking, what is your community going to look like 10, 15? 200 years from now, um, sort of explore that idea there. You can also explore the night sky and stargazing and see, you know, are there other worlds beyond ours that maybe reflect your community in some way? Um, and certainly you can use this uh, for one of your writing workshops, maybe have members of your community 
um, write what they think their town's going to look like in a few years. So um, all sorts of fun ways of exploring your imagination and connecting with the book. Um, so I will go ahead and pass it back to Josh. All right, thanks, John. Now I'm going to take you all on a tour through our grants portal named uh, Smart Simple. We'll go through the application process. So um, just to give a few quick items before I launch into how to navigate uh, all of this is to um, visit this URL here. And uh, there are some deadlines there on the screen, um, January 10th is when we will need just a few pieces of information from uh, applicants. Um, we will assess eligibility uh, based on your responses, and then we will forward you on to the full application, which isn't due until the end of the month on January 24th. So right now I'll go through the uh, registration process. So allow me to quickly configure a few things here. And now you should be able to view the uh, landing page, the login page for our grants portal, which we fondly refer to as Smart Simple. So if you have logged into this portal before, you will see that the funding opportunity for the NEA Big Read is right there on your homepage. Um, but for the sake of those of you that are new or are returning and have never filled out um, an application with us using this portal, I'll walk through the registration system. So when you're on this landing page, if you haven't applied with us in the last one or two years, uh, you'll wanna click this register button down here and you'll be presented with a few different options uh, depending on uh, what your organization is. I'll say the most common registration pathway is the first one, which is for any 501c3 uh, organization. Uh, if you're a university and you're not applying under uh, the university foundation or a board of regents, but you're applying as the university itself, you can go ahead and click the second one. The third is for um, government entities. So if you are a political subdivision, for instance, you're a county or a city, uh, you can apply using a third option. And then the rest are fairly self-explanatory. So a school district, uh, or a tribal nation, you have your own pathways here. Um, this last one is not applicable to this particular program. So um, again, any individuals will not be eligible for any of these. Um, for the sake of uh, uh, time and clarity and most common pathway, I'm gonna select registered nonprofit organization and just kind of go through this one really quick. So now what we will see is a way to look up your organization in the IRS database. That's where this pulls from. I would say the easiest way to uh, grab your organization is to just enter your EIN number and then click search. Um, I'm just gonna put in Arts Midwest details here in the name. You don't necessarily have to fill all, all of these, but it can help refine the list you'll be presented with in a second here. So I'm just gonna type in Arts Midwest, click search, and it'll present me with everything that relates to that search query. But I found my organization here, Arts Midwest. All you have to do is click this. And then all of the information that uh, you have registered with the IRS is filled out here at the top. Um, you can't edit it at this point, uh, but you will be able to once you're actually in the system. So um, what you'll just need to do here is provide us with a few pieces of information uh, in these boxes that are not grayed out. So first we ask for just information about the organization, and then we're going to be asking information about you, the primary user tied to this organization. So um, for the sake of um, ease. You can say, I want to copy everything from the fields above, because that's the best way to contact me. And then you'll be entering your name, title, email, and then phone number. And if you have any alternate email where we can get you at, that would be great to put in here. And also confirm that you're human down at the bottom. Once you submit this, I won't do so now, but once you submit this, 
you should get an email that will allow you to log into the system, set your password, and then you will be in. So I'm going to pause now and also share some next steps once you start your application. So allow me to transition my screen once more. So when you log in, this should be the first thing that you see, which is your home page in Smart Simple. I'm just going to cover a few things here. First and foremost will be your organization profile. So I'm going to click on this to start. And now you'll see that you have access to make any adjustments to your address if it's slightly out of sync with what you look up on uh, the first step we talked about. Ideally, this will be your mailing address. So when you, uh, if and when you receive a grant for this program, this will be the address we'll use in order to send your grant checks. So we want to make sure this is a mailing address, correct mailing address for you. The rest of this uh, particular page has to do with all of your organization details. Um, we will need a mission statement um, and all the rest of these fields filled out. There's not a lot of them, but this is where we will ask for your UEI number. Um, just to clarify, the UEI number will not be necessary in order to apply but we will need a UEI number from all applicants at the time of an award. So by April of next year, uh, you will need a UEI number. And once you get it, you can come back into your organization profile and stick it right in this box and save your work. So we ask for all this information just once it will populate into your application form so you don't have to enter it again. I'm going to go back to my home screen and show you how to begin your intent to apply. So at the top here, we have the applications section. And right now, we have three funding opportunities for all registrants um, to choose from. So if I click into this, you'll see that the NEA Big Read is one of them. You'll be able to access a Word document copy of the guidelines, which you can reference as you go along in your application. But I'm going to go ahead and click the Apply Now button for Big Read so I can get started. Now there's a few instructions here at the top. And we say to start, first click Save right at the bottom. Once that button is clicked, the screen will refresh, and then you will see the information that you plugged into your organization profile appear right in this form. Uh, just to cover a few more things on the instructions page here, um, you must complete this form first by January 10th so we can assess your eligibility. If you need to communicate with us at Arts Midwest, we recommend using this notes feature here on the left sidebar. You'll just need to visit this, click the plus sign to make a new note, and you can see it will be sent to us here at Arts Midwest. You could type a message to us and we'll get back to you uh, in the same fashion. If you need to add someone that is um, a part of your partner organizations or someone else at your organization, you can definitely add a collaborator to your application. You would just need to click this plus sign, enter their details, and then invite them. Once that happens, they will get a similar uh, email that you got once uh, you registered with your organization. They'll also need to look up their organization, put in their user information, and then they will be put into this same application. So you both can work on it um, at the same time. All right, I'm going to go back to the main screen and just cover a few more things here. The application or the intent to apply in this case is broken out into two different tabs. This first tab should be already filled out for you based on your organization profile information. The next is application details. And this, where, this is where the meat of the application will be uh, for your intent to apply. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to enter some test information. You can see that 
the, there are character counts that count down as you type for several of these fields. I'm going to select that I have, have not been a prior uh, grant recipient from Earth and West before. Simple yes or no question. Your project start and end dates for this are as follows. So if you want to enter um, a date here in the project start date, you can enter something as early as September 1st, 2024. That's when programs can start. As far as a project end date, you can go through June 30th, 2025. So those, that's the window of opportunity for conducting programs. And I mentioned earlier that you can have your programs last about a month. That's pretty typical. You can go over several months, but those are the boundaries at the start and finish of when programs can happen. Also, like I mentioned earlier in the session, you'll need to describe um, the rationale for your chosen book and how you will use it to relate to the theme of where we live. All eligible uh, 50 book titles are here in this list. So pick which one you would like to program with. It's organized by author first, and then the name of the book um, afterwards. And then of course, you can enter your grant amount, which is again between 5,000 at the low boundary and 20,000 at the high boundary. So I'm gonna shoot for the moon here and request $20,000 I'm going to put in just some test information. Of course, you'll want to put in a lot more than that, but I'm going to go ahead and click Submit Intent to Apply now. You can also save your work uh, and come back to it, as I suspect you'll want to do. I'm going to submit my intent to apply. Oh, no, I forgot to click the book title. Well, I should probably do that. So it'll catch any errors or um, uh, omissions that you have. Now you should see that your submission was successful and that you can await uh, further instructions. So now I'm just going to do some behind the scenes tweaking so you can see what the uh, full application looks like. So bear with me for just one second while I forward this on, assuming that this is an eligible uh, intent to apply. I'm just going to forward it on and show you what everything looks like uh, once you have submitted that. All right. So I'm back on the home screen now. And you can see that I have one uh, application in progress. If you have saved and returned later, say you didn't submit your intent to apply yet, but you came back and you want to finish it, you will find it in the in progress tile here. You don't need to go back to funding opportunities to create a new one. Whenever you start one, it'll be in the in progress tile. So I can see that I can open it up again. And now I will see all sorts of new goodies, new questions to answer amongst these different tabs. So I'm not going to go through all of the different questions we have here uh, for the sake of time, but you'll see that there are more questions. We do have a sample PDF of what a full application looks like. So if you don't want to register quite yet, um, we do have a sample application that just tells you everything that we ask in the application. And we'll share that just in a bit. Um, we do ask for a project budget, and I do want to go over this uh, really quickly, uh, just so because we get a lot of questions about how to put in uh, budget items. There is some instructions here on this card, but what we're asking for um, is essentially all of your expenses. So I'm going to open this, and I'm going to hope that it works for the sake of purposes. There we go. All right, so to enter your budget expenses in this window, you're gonna be able to add different rows representing a new expense for each one of these things. So say you have uh, a book expense, which we would pretty typically expect. And now you would put the expense, the dollar amount for that uh, particular item in one or several of these columns. So for example, if I want 
the books could be covered by the grant itself. I could put in that amount here and you'll start to see things subtotal as you go on. Now you'll have to be mindful of what your grant request is. So if you requested $20,000, the subtotal of your paid by grant column should be about, should be $20,000. Uh, let's say I want to um, have some venue space that I'm going to be using for a match and the value of renting that venue space would be $1,000 for the time I need it. And you can see that that subtotals as well. And that this area here will be representing and calculating your total match. So again, if you request uh, $10,000 for your grant, the total of your grant column will be 10,000. And then your total match will also be 10,000 or higher. So any value put in the paid by applicant, which is you, the applicant organization, if you're covering that expense, that will go in the paid by applicant column. For paid by third party, any expense that's covered by a partner or another non-federal grant, for example, that will go in the paid by third party column. And then of course, if you're receiving anything in kind, then that will go there. Uh, just remember to save your work. And then you'll see that you can see the progress of your budget uh, right here on the main application screen. And we do encourage you to use the space just below here to offer some more details about your budget um, because we don't have description boxes in the budget form itself. So use this area. There's no character limit. Use this area to describe uh, your budget in a little bit more detail for the panel uh, to review. So I think I'm going to pause there and go back to our main application, our main presentation rather, and talk a little bit more now about some of the application resources. So a couple folks who registered asked for advice for first time applicants. So to help applicants build strong applications, Arts Midwest provides resources to help um, applicants put in strong applications for the panel to review. And that includes the following resources you can see on your screen. And my colleague, John, will start uh, putting links to those in the chat. We've had some very nice, generous past grantees offer up some of their applications that they submitted last year um, as examples for others to follow. Um, we took a look at um, all of the applications that we got last year and reached out to a few of those past grantees because we thought their application was particularly strong. So we'd encourage you to take a look at what they submitted for their application. And now the application is going to be a little bit different, but um, use those as kind of a guide about how much detail to provide is really what we're um, suggesting there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is a full preview of the application in PDF form, which you can take a look at. Uh, earlier this summer, in anticipation of launching this program and a couple others, we created uh, a little blog post about the best practices to applying for federal grant applications. That's on the Arts Midwest website, so I encourage you to take a look at that. We have a, a 10 uh, item list of those best practices, as well as information about how to uh, get your UEI number from SAM.gov. Um, just a few more here. We do have uh, a sign up. If you want to speak with uh, myself or John for 15 minutes to just talk about some of your thoughts you have about um, what you're thinking for your NEA Big Read programs, or if you want us to do a quick review of what you've put in for your application for technical accuracy, you can use that sign up um, to speak with us directly. And the last bullet includes um, some training on how to work with local partners, how to run virtual programs and how to work with schools and more. And these were developed by our past grantees as well. So if you want it, straight from the folks who have done this before, go check out um, our resources on our website. 
Uh, it's called the Tools for Applicants and Grantees Accordion on that link that John has, has shared out. And it covers all those topics. They're recorded Zoom sessions from years past. And finally, um, if you visit the arts.gov website, you can peruse the book choices there. There are some programming examples that appear there for certain books if you're looking for more examples of past programming. All right, so I know we spammed a lot of links at you and you probably have some questions. I see those coming in. So now we're at the point where we're going to address those questions and uh, then do some wrap up. Thanks, Josh. So we have a few questions uh, in the queue already. If you do have questions, feel free to put them in that Q&A section um, so they pop up for us. They might get a little bit lost in the chat. Um, so the first question up is, we are a nonprofit book and literary arts organization that is going to partner with our local library. Uh, which organization should submit the application itself? Um, great question. Um, for the most part, it's kind of up to you and your partner as to who that application uh, will come from. Just keep in mind that the applicant, um, if awarded, will also be the ones responsible for the funds and all the required reporting. Yeah. Next up, um, I know the NEA is a national grant, but would only organizations in the Midwest use this portal? Um, nope. So you'll want to use that smart, simple portal no matter where you are. Um, in the country, that's where everybody will be applying through. Next question is, how competitive is this grant application process? What percentage of applications are generally approved? And Josh, do you want to take this one? Sure, I'll take this one. So it, it really depends. Um, but in past years, we've seen around 200 or so applications. And then the awards typically range in the between 60 or 70 across the nation. So that's, um, you can get a sense of how competitive it is uh, based on those numbers. Okay, next up, if we ask for 20,000, might we be awarded a lesser amount if remaining award funds are low or will we just be rejected from be, uh, rejected because we can't uh, meet the asked amount? Josh, you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I'll tackle that one. So um, we strive to award everybody at their full grant request amount. It's fairly rare that we would significantly shave off anyone's um, request amount. With that being said, uh, there might be some rounding that happens in order to get to the amount of funds that we have available to distribute for the program. Uh, but again, we try and award everybody at their full request. Next up, um, is it okay to choose a local high school library as a partner for the Big Read program? Josh? Um, ideally, it would be a public library because they have a little bit more resource um, available and capacity to conduct a community-wide reading program like this. So um, ideally, it would be a public library that's the main partner, but um, the high school library could, of course, participate and offer their own programs as well. Next up, how many participants are required? I assume this uh, is geared towards how many folks from the community you want participating in your events. Um, there's no, no requirement for this. Um, every community is going to be different. Certainly, um, if you're coming from a smaller rural area, we wouldn't see, uh, we wouldn't expect you to match maybe the numbers that a more urban area would. Um, so it's all going to be dependent upon your community, but there's not a particular threshold that we're looking for for this one. Next question is, if we submit our intent to apply early before January 10th, will we still have, will we then have access to the application? Yes. So as soon as you enter your intent to apply and we take a look at it and make sure everything um, looks good from an eligibility standpoint, um, we will go ahead and then move you directly into that application phase. Next question, will organizations hear from you after submitting the January 10th intent to apply to confirm that we are eligible to move forward? Yep, um, most we, we will also hear from us uh, if there are any issues with that, um, but you will get an email confirming that you've moved on to that proposal phase. 
Yep, and I forgot to mention this in my uh, quick review tour of the Smart Simple system. So you'll get an email that looks something like this. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, that says you're ready to begin your application. Just visit this link and you'll be able to get in. And if you go to that in progress tile, like I showed, you'll be able to complete the rest of your application. And the last one we have in our queue currently, um, Josh, maybe you can tackle this one a bit, um, but partnering with school libraries is not encouraged, but what about schools or classes in general? Definitely encourage partnerships with schools and classes. So um, it's just really the, the library partnership um, that we have that encouragement on. So get as many schools involved um, as you care to, and inc that includes classes as well. I will also tag on to this question that we commonly uh, get a question from institutions of higher education if we can use the university library as the library partner. And the answer there is ideally, you would look off campus to the local library uh, somewhere nearby, just so that the programming isn't all contained just on that campus. We want it to be a community-wide uh, program. And next question on the list. So do you need to decide on the particular book choice in order to submit the intent? or can you wait until the full application to decide? Um, that is a piece that you will need to decide before you submit the intent to apply is there's a few other um, questions, some of those short descriptions about your programming. So that's something that you will wanna decide early on and, and that is a part of the required intent to apply as well. And I did see a question in the chat about is the chat going to be available after this? And what we're going to do um, is take this recording, clean it up a little bit, and put it on the Arts Midwest YouTube page within a few days. In the description, we will include all of the links that we've shared here today. And another question that came through, is it desirable to have multiple partners for the application, like park district, library, and school district? Uh, the more the merrier, I always say. It all depends on your capacity and what feels appropriate for the size of the community that you're trying to reach. Um, but at the very minimum, the library partnership is required if you, the applicant, are not a library. Uh, so, but yes, the more the merrier um, to facilitate different pieces of the program, perhaps one partner is better suited to conducting outreach another per partner is better suited to hosting programs, um, so on and so forth. Next up, can we fine tune the theme after we submit the intent to apply? Um, yeah, absolutely. The, a lot of the details um, and specifics aren't gonna come out until you get into sort of that full application. So um, you can really kind of drill down into that a little bit more as you fill out the full application. Good questions. And that's everything that we have in our queue so far. All right, and I'm showing that the chat is also clear. I think we answered everybody's question up until this point. Um, so unless there are any other questions that you wanna submit right now, maybe you're cooking up a question in your mind. If that's the case, then I invite you to send us a message. You can email us at grants at artsmidwest.org, and we will do our best to answer your question in a timely manner. Um, and when you begin to submit your intents to apply, again, you can use that notes feature to communicate with us as well, and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. But with that, and on behalf of Arts Midwest, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you for joining this presentation here today. Hope you all have a good holiday season coming up.